Come on, Snake. We made it. We made it. Over there. It's the boss, isn't it? I'll go get the wig ready to take off. Right. I'll leave you two alone. But come back in one piece, okay? Promise me! Life's end. Isn't it beautiful? It's almost tragic. When life ends, it gives off a final lingering aroma. Light is but a farewell gift from the darkness to those on their way to die. I've been waiting, Snake, for a long time. Waiting for your birth, your growth, and the finality of today. Boss, why are you doing this? Why? To make the world one again. The world used to be whole. But with the end of the Second World War, the philosophers began to fight amongst themselves, and the world was torn apart. The Cobras, my comrades, who trained and fought alongside me, were torn apart as well. The foibles of politics and the march of time can turn friends into enemies just as easily as the wind changes. Ridiculous, isn't it? Yesterday's ally becomes today's opposition. And this Cold War? Think back. When I was leading the Cobras, America and Russia were fighting together. Now, consider whether America and Russia will still be enemies in the 21st century. Somehow, I doubt it. Enemies change along with the times, the flow of the ages, and we soldiers are forced to play along. I didn't raise you and shape you into the man you are today, just so we could face each other in battle. A soldier's skills aren't meant to be used to hurt friends. So then what is an enemy? Is there such a thing as an absolute timeless enemy? There is no such thing, and never has been. 
And the reason is that our enemies are human beings like us. They can only be our enemies in relative terms. The world must be made whole again. The philosophers must be reunited. I will devote my skills to that purpose. And with the Colonel's money, I will achieve that end. Just as I once created the Cobras. They are my family. I may no longer be able to bear children, but I still have a family. It was November 1st, 1951. I was in the Nevada desert participating in atomic testing. The name Nevada is derived from Spanish, covered in snow, white as snow. And snow is exactly what I saw in that Nevada desert. It froze my blood white. Snake, you were an atomic test subject, weren't you? On Bikini Atoll. That's part of the reason I was drawn to you. You and I are alike. We're both slowly being eaten away by the karma of others. We'll never have the chance to die peacefully of old age. We have no tomorrow. But we can still have hope for the future. In 1960, I saw a vision of the ideal future from space. Three years earlier, the Soviet Union had succeeded in launching Sputnik, the first man-made satellite in history, into orbit. This came as a huge shock to the United States. In response, America threw everything it had into its own manned spaceflight project, the Mercury program. Even as the Soviets seemed poised to send their first man into space, America was still experimenting with chimpanzees and rockets. The government wanted human data. So they secretly decided to send a human being into space. I was the one they chose. At the time, they didn't have the technology to block out cosmic rays, and whoever they sent up would inevitably be exposed to heavy radiation. That's why they chose me. After all, I'd already been irradiated once. Of course, you won't find any of this in the history books. I could see the planet as it appeared from space. That's when it finally hit me. Space exploration is nothing but another game in the power struggle between the U.S. and the USSR. Politics, economics, the arms race, they're all just arenas for meaningless competition. I'm sure you can see that, but the Earth itself has no boundaries. No East, no West, no Cold War. And the irony of it is, the United States and the Soviet Union are spending billions on their space programs and the missile race, only to arrive at the same conclusion. In the 21st century, everyone will be able to see that we are all just inhabitants of a little celestial body called Earth. A world without communism or capitalism, that is the world I wanted to see. But reality continued to betray me. In 1961, I was sent to Cuba, to Bahia de Cochinos. It was part of a CIA-sponsored invasion under the guise of taking Cuban exiles back to their country. But the U.S. government betrayed them. Our weak-kneed president held back their air support. Defenseless, the exiles were annihilated by the Cuban army. All I could do was watch in silence. I was set up by the very country I'd sacrificed so much for, by the very government I dedicated my life to defending. I was driven from the surface world, and I went underground. 
Then, two years ago, I faced the sorrow. My old comrade in battle.